Good morning. Thank you for joining us for today's edition of Super Simply Put Palms. This is the second of six webinars in our Super Simply Put series. The information we share is a product of decades of direct field experience working with our palms and is presented by Mr. George Nottingham. George is the president and founder of Groundworks of Palm Beach County and Groundworks Texas. During the past 35 years, George has spent thousands of hours in the field working with our palms and has developed, practiced, and documented many highly effective handling, installation, maintenance, and disease risk mitigation procedures that Groundworks employs to earn a living, providing consistently exceptional results to our clients. We fully realize that we are presenting to industry professionals, many of which have years of experience handling palms. We recognize that there are many different approaches and many paths to success out on site. This webinar series is meant to provide participants with information that they may consider useful, and we hope that just as we share what we know with each of you, you might at some time choose to share your experiences with us. In our industry, there is far too much to know for any one of us to be an expert, but by learning from each other, we collectively create real expertise that enhances our businesses and the industry we serve. We do not want to waste your time, so the information we share is designed to be immediately actionable. It is our intent that participants can take this information out into the field and use it immediately to enhance the quality of their results, thereby improving their profitability and growing their professional reputations. We share this information with everyone because we believe that no matter where palms are sourced, if the palms are delivering a consistently strong performance, then by their presence looking gorgeous out in the public domain, they will act to breed new demand that will help the industry grow. During the presentation, all participants will be muted. However, your questions are vital to the experience. So please, if you have a question, hit the button that raises your hand and type your question into the chat. Once George has completed the presentation, he will do his best to answer any questions. Thanks for listening and here's George. Good morning. I'm George Nottingham with Groundworks. This is the second in uh, a series of webinars we're doing that we're calling Super Simply Put. Um, we go that route and we, we um, are presenting in this fashion because there's just so darn much to know. Uh, our, our industry uh, is complex and a lot of folks don't realize that. Uh, I myself take just a whole bunch of different classes on insects and on plant diseases. Um, just a whole big broad range of topics. And it seems like it, it never really ends. Um, the bottom line though is that I just like you have to at some point make decisions on how to spend my time and, and, and how well the things that I'm uh, educating myself with can actually use today right now to earn a living. Um, being a guy who's really a palm tree guy, not so much an educator, I recognize that it's absolutely essential that um, whatever time I spend, whatever time you guys spend uh, in the office and out uh, on site, we got to be aiming in the direction of, um, of making a living. And of course, the best way to accomplish that in our industry is to see to it that the material we put on site uh, performs really well. Landscape architects out there that are specking uh, big specimen palms, um, it's important for contractors to realize that that landscape architect is not, is not really specking a big palm tree. They're specking how they look. And it's incumbent on all of us to make sure that how they look is fantastic, uh, not just on day one, uh, but in the weeks and then months and then in the years that follow. This webinar um, is uh, titled uh, to be about uh, pindo palms, butea capitata, as well as uh, windmill palms. The time restriction kind of left me without the ability to go a lot into windmills today because I want to cover something that is very, very important to performance on site. And it's something that's overlooked all the time. Um, the, what you're looking at on the screen right now is just a simple example of, of how many uh, different ways a pindo can actually, can actually show up. For a landscape architect, writing a specification that spells out uh, more than just the clear trunk size is really very important with a seedling produced palm like a pendo. Um, they actually do come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, some will be greener, some will be more silvery or silvery blue. Some will have a, a tighter, denser canopy and then others will, uh, oops, 
Yeah, others out in the field will have a canopy that is a little less dense, a little bit longer frond, a little more dense. The point is that um, if you have something in particular in mind, it's very, very important that you, that you specify that. So for instance, if the design intent calls for a more silvery green color, you probably want to put that on the plan. And then contractors, when you're uh, talking to your vendors, you're going to want to be letting them know that you need palms that are more on the silvery side versus on the green side. Same applies to the frond structure. Many pindos can be uh, very upright. Uh, others can be, well, kind of like this one is, much more flowing and tropical. If you have a formal setting where, for instance, you're lining a roadway or something like that, you're going to want a more upright palm. Otherwise, the fronds will end up out in the road. Um, or you may want tropical, I guess it all depends. But the point is that you have the opportunity to say what you want and then contractors speaking to their vendors can send that information along. This is it's just a pin down that's out in the field. Um, this happens to be a very, very heavy calipered ceiling. They're available like this. Um, and what you can end up with are aesthetics like that. Um, these palms are extremely durable. They're very, very cold hardy. Uh, the beautiful thing about pindos is that you get the pinnate frond, which gives you a tropical appearance. But it's also a palm that, I'll tell you, golly, out in the field, we've seen 16 and 17 degree freezes. And I kid you not, it, it almost looks like they like it. I, I, it doesn't make any sense, but it's true. Um, so, you know, where you're looking at uh, different kinds of landscape themes, um, and in particular in markets, you know, where freezes are more common, don't decide that a palm is only something you can use at the pool or that it's only something you can use in a protected area because that's just not, not accurate. Uh, in particular with Uteas, you can put them pretty much in full northern exposure. And so long as you don't have a, you know, a seven or eight or nine degree freeze, if you have a normal, call it 17, 18, 19 degree freeze, the palm's gonna come through that weather really, really well. Um, most important thing being that it be established on site before the advent of a freeze. Now these are slow growers. So you wanna keep that in mind, meaning that they will take yeah, three months or so to really have good capillary root regeneration. That simply means that if you're going on site after say September 1st, you start to get into a window where you have a potential for some issues if we get a really, really hard freeze. But for the most part, that palm is a no brainer. There's one simple disease issue that you gotta watch out for, but other than that, it really doesn't have any problems at all. This is also something that a lot of folks don't realize you don't have to have them straight. The uh, out in the fields, in our fields, as well as in other fields, uh, there are quite a few beautiful curved trunk pindos. In a place like Dallas or somewhere where we know we're gonna have a freeze, but you want a tropical, uh, create a tropical appeal, you can get pindos with beautiful curves and then use those pindos near the pool or somewhere near a chicky hut or a tiki hut or anywhere in the backyard or for that matter, in the front yard in a landscape island, and you can create a look and a feel that's just tropical and gorgeous, but at the same time, isn't gonna absolutely go bonkers when we have a hard freeze. Um, mixing curved trunk pindos into the design definitely does create a super unique tropical look, and you're doing it with something that you could pretty well rely on to be bulletproof during the weather. Now, this is something, maybe it seems obvious, I don't know, but in a scenario like this, this was a, a curved trunk pindo that was planted out on site. Um, not really sure how it occurred, but the, the contractor installing it installed it as though it were a straight tree. And obviously that's you know, really not the direction you wanna go. Um, let me show you something here. Let's see how this goes. Yeah, this same palm had it been planted at an angle like this would have ended up looking very, very natural. Okay, that's, that's the way you would want to install a curved trunk pindo. Um, we, you know, we recommend that you use some staking and I hope you guys will forgive my little line drawing here, but it was the easiest way to do it. Um, but in any case, whoops, sorry about that. That was me and my incompetence. There we go. This kind, this kind of a palm with that big, beautiful curve 
will give you a look that you just can't get with really any other cold hardy palm. So don't decide that you can only go with a straight trunk. If you're looking for a really neat tropical setting, consider that you can do something that a lot of folks just don't believe you can do. This, this what we're about to talk about right now is something that is, is um, something that I've learned over the years. Um, I'm not sure how many of my uh, contractor associates are aware of this. We have all done it. Um, all of us for many, many years would put a single strap around that trunk, pick the palm up and take it to where it goes. And in many cases, it's not a problem. In many cases, you're gonna get away with it and it's not gonna be an issue. But in many other cases, you end up with you plant seven or eight palms on site and move them this way. And you're three or four months in, a couple of them are just performing really poorly or they develop disease on the trunk and the darn trunk snaps almost exclusively. If you really knew what happened, you could look back and realize that it wasn't so much that the palm just failed. What happened was compression damage. When we pick these palms up and we move them around on site like this with a single, see that? That's the kind of thing that can actually happen. And, and when it, whoops, sorry, that's my incompetence again. When this occurs, oh, come on, George. When this occurs, it leaves you in a you have done damage to the conductive tissue of that trunk without even realizing it. This palm is a small one, and I happen to use a Sylvesterus for this particular example, but this palm only weighs about 2,000 pounds with the root ball. When I've got that strap around the trunk and I'm grabbing it, the entire amount of the weight of, this, of that palm, darn it, the entire amount of the weight of that palm is concentrated on the area of that strap. And to think that with a fibrous trunk, you're not setting up circumstances where, where you're going to cause some compression damage is unrealistic. It definitely does occur. I've cut open a whole bunch of dead palm trees and actually been able to see where that compression damage ended up. Um, again, with some species like medjools, it's really nowhere near as important because medjools have a very hard woody petiole and that petiole protects the pseudobark under it. But with many other varieties, and actually most varieties, where the petiole uh, has either been cut away or where, like with a Sylvesterus, where the petiole is fairly thin, if you've got a 16 foot clear trunk Sylvesterus and you're grabbing it around the stem just like that, and then you're going across the average construction site where you're bouncing along and boom, 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 not only do you risk losing control of the palm and having it slip like it did in that video, but you're causing compression damage under that petiole. And that leads to places that you definitely don't want to go. This is called cradle strapping. It's really, really simple. You have the palm laying on the ground and you're basically going to take a, what we call a cradling strap and just lay it over the root ball just like that and lay it onto the trunk, just like that. Nothing to it. You're not wrapping around anything. All you're doing is going around the bottom of that root ball and then just laying it right there on the trunk. I didn't really mean to play that one a second time. Not really sure why I did that. We're still getting good at this thing. So you got to forgive me. We're better with the palms than we are with the computer technology. Now what you're seeing right here is the trunk strap. Now you see with that trunk strap, I'm going to stop that right there. You see that? It's not actually done as a noose around that trunk. It's just wrapped around the bottom of it. So it's not actually grabbing the trunk at all. It's just wrapped around the bottom. And then you bring the two ends up together and you bring them through your cradling strap. See what they're doing there? Very, very simple. Nothing, nothing to it. Um, there is a, a couple little important things here. Probably one of the most important things is that you're gonna wanna make really, really sure that that trunk strap but you take the lower side of it and you slide it up. Okay, you'll see why here in just a minute. But you want to go ahead, you get through, and again, you see that we're not noosed around the trunk. All we've done is bring this trunk strap around the base of the trunk, bring it together, and just bring it right up through the cradling strap. And then we're going to reach down there and we're going to make darn sure that this lower section of that strap, see, I just did it with my foot. You like that? 
Lever section of that strap is pushed up. These guys are going to make sure, yep, there it is, all the way up. Very good. And let's see if we can go one more time. There we go. So once you've got that all the way up like that, you're pretty much ready to go. That's really all there is to setting up a cradling strap. Very important. And this is something to teach the guys. And also for landscape architects, when you're specifying cradle strapping, we can actually give you a little video just like this that you can use to send to contractors so they can understand better how to do this because it's not hard at all, but it has real benefits. I'm trying to switch to the next slide. Okay, here we go. So we created straps around the bottom there and we have a trunk strap that's just looped under the palm. It's not noosed around the trunk at all. We're gonna grab onto the trunk strap and all we're really using that trunk strap for is to stand it up. And yes, that's me, yours truly in that bobcat. Now bear in mind that this is a Sylvester's, but this, is, this, this process, this method is applicable to any variety of palm. We recommend that even the jewels be carried this way, even though they've got a tough patio and you don't really have to do it from a health wise or from, a, you know, from the perspective of causing compression damage. You'll see here in a second that what this leaves you with is a really well controlled scenario. Once we got the palm up in the air, all the weight is on that cradling strap. So right now we really don't have any real weight at all on the trunk strap up there. And it allows us to carry this palm. Let's see, let's see. see that? You carry that palm. You have really good control of the load. There's no way it's going to slip and cause damage to the patio on the outside. And more importantly, you're not creating compression damage under the strap that's around the trunk. That's, a, that's the whole ballgame. There's a, there's a disease that we commonly call chalara. Um, it's uh, Theviopsis or Theviolopsis paradoxa, hard to, hard to pronounce that one. But in any case, it invades uh, the trunk in areas where the trunk is damaged. Uh, where you have significant compression damage, it's not uncommon. This is an airborne pathogen. We have it uh, in South Florida and all over Florida. We have it all over Texas. It's a very common airborne pathogen. It doesn't usually bother the palms, but it will get into them. And if it's gonna get into them, it's generally gonna get into them somewhere where we've inadvertently damaged the palms. Now, the problem with compression damage is there's really nothing that you can see to tell you that it occurred. You know, you might be able to look at the palm while it's hanging in the air and you got the one strap around it and you can see the strap bleeding. So you know that with all that moisture coming off the strap, you've got an incredible amount of pressure that you're putting on that trunk. But for the most part, once you let go of it, there's nothing you're gonna see in that palm that's gonna tell you that you inadvertently caused damage. You're just basically, it's just basically one of those things that'll reveal itself somewhere down the road. And where it's gonna reveal itself, it's gonna be in the performance of the palm. Now, as I said earlier, for all of us in this business, we gotta look great on day one. The material's gotta be healthy and beautiful on day one. But what your client is buying and my client is buying, what your landscape architect and what the landscape architect out there is specifying is not so much just the palm, the spec and how it's gonna look. Well, when you do cradle strapping and you, and you institute it as a policy, or when an LA specs that the palms be carried using cradle strapping, they're not imposing any kind of an additional cost, but they're definitely buying insurance. It's something that can go wrong, doesn't always, but something that can go wrong, it's not going to go wrong. And you're not going to end up in a situation like this. This is what happens to something like a Pinda that wasn't cradle strapped. Look at that. That one is almost worth playing again. So let me see if I can do it again. There we go. The root ball is not moving. Okay, this palm suffered serious fracture damage at the root trunk interface. There are certain varieties uh, that are more susceptible to this kind of damage than others. GTs are one of them. Uh, Mediterranean fans happens, to, that's Shamrops um, <clears throat> it can It can actually happen to, to most seedling grown palms. So it could happen to Canariensis, it could happen uh, well, obviously to a Pindo. It could even happen to a windmill. It doesn't very often because they're not very heavy. But anytime you have a very, very heavy palm, the particular one that's grown from seed, 
as opposed to one that's grown from a shoot. One that's grown from a shoot has more of a woody interior on that trunk, and it's not likely that you'll cause this kind of damage, but it is possible. This is another that suffered a little bit of damage, but this one wasn't as bad. Now, these palms aren't dead. They'll be on site. You may come out if you're in LA, you'll come out and look at it, you might approve it. Um, it might be two months before the palm starts losing fronds. And then it's not growing. It's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's, it's not dead, but it's not really demonstrating any kind of vigor. And then it will slowly fade. Now, as it weakens, potential for disease establishment begins to aggregate. Um, but, but more importantly, anything that goes wrong environmentally, any kind of a storm, a big wind storm, something like that, a tropical event, anything like that that comes along. And when you have that kind of motion at the root trunk interface, when you have the ability for that palm to actually move around like that, you got to realize that you have the potential for that palm tree to snap off and fall down. This is totally avoidable again. It's something you just don't have to have happen. You want to end up like this. This palm was, cra it was cradled throughout its handling. Um, it was installed correctly, which is a webinar we're going to do a little bit later. Um, and what we have is a palm that's firmly attached to the root ball. It's solid at the root trunk interface. Uh, conduction is very, very strong. And the palm itself is just beautiful out on site. The, this is what all of our clients are looking for. I'm going to play one other little video. I want you to know that I don't just talk about this stuff. We actually, we actually practice what we preach. This is called cradling. Basically what we're doing, we have the lower strap across the root ball on the bottom. It comes up to a strap that just goes around the trunk, but doesn't noose around it. The bottom strap runs through the top strap. So that bottom strap is called the cradling strap. And in this fashion, when we carry the palm out of the field or when you're carrying on a job site, the majority of the weight of that root ball is actually being carried by that cradling strap. And as a result, you avoid damage that can occur at the root trunk interface when you're bouncing along. This is called cradling, and it is really, really important when handling heavy palms. You know, that, that speaks for itself. The, um, that particular little video clip is one that I shot out on the farm. This is the only way that Groundworks handles these and other varieties of palms. Um, I cannot recommend it strongly enough. As I said, not only does cradling give you better control of the palm, so is that when you're moving around on site, it doesn't slip and you don't end up causing damage uh, well, hidden damage to the petiole, but also aesthetic damage to the petiole. But then also, six months, eight months, 10 months, a year in, two years in, that client, the end user, who's the, the, the guy or girl who's actually paying all of our bills, walks out into their yard and looks at those palms and says, golly, did I spend that money well. If we can accomplish that together, gang, if we can make that happen together, then what we will do is we will grow our industry, we'll grow the use of palms in our industry, and all of us will be positioned to, to do just a little better in our lives. To my mind, that's a good thing. And that's really what we're gonna focus on as we go forward with the rest of our, uh, with the rest of our webinar series. We've got um, a couple of minutes. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them. I do my best to hopefully not come across a question I can't answer, but after 35 years of doing what I do, um, I've, I've seen quite a bit out in the field. So if anyone has any questions, let me know. I've asked everyone to unmute. Is it obvious how to do that, Pete? And is there a reason that we can't do it for them? Because we mute them. No, I unmuted. Okay. Yeah, it's a it's a, a security feature. They they don't allow you to unmute participants because they may not want you to hear them. Okay. Well, shall I assume that no one has questions? <laughs> you have any questions, Melissa? <laughs> okay. Well, then I will say thank you very much um, for participating. We will be posting this uh, instruction. This is a, uh, I guess you call it an educational webinar, but it's more or less a, a uh, professional recommendation uh, webinar. We'll be posting it on datepalm.com. Um, so for anyone who's interested in looking at it, we welcome your, uh, we welcome your interest and look forward to serving you. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, George.